The international idea, they, they argue that, that the link between democracy and development, it becomes even more pressing in the case of resource-rich democracies, such as this one here in Botswana. I just wondered what lessons we can draw specifically from your research here and in countries such as the DRC or Sierra Leone. Well, I think, I think the, you know, the secret of success in Botswana has certainly been inclusive institutions in the way we talk about it, both in the political sphere and in the economic sphere. And you could say that is, you know, that is critical because you, know, you have a country like this, which is dominated, you know, the economy was completely dominated by diamond mining uh, in the 1970s when it was trying to take off to kind of build basic infrastructure, schools, you know, to get the country, hospitals, to get the country on its feet. Then it's crucial to manage this natural resource wealth uh, in the nature, in the interests of society. And that's exactly what they managed to do, both by building a state, an inclusive state, by building an inclusive democratic political system. It made sure there was accountability, there was transparency, there was capacity to use all this natural wealth for the benefit of society. And, you know, that's an enormous challenge in a lot of resource rich, poor countries like the Democratic Republic of Congo or the Sudan or many other places like that. If you look at the history of Botswana, for example, you know, the first, the first, after they became independent, the first uh, session of parliament uh, that they had, Suretsi Kama, you know, uh, proposed, they basically discussed two measures. And the first measure was about civil administration, about how to build a really effective non-political civil administration in this country. And one of the issues was, how can we make use of all these expatriate skills. You know, we need skills, we need expertise, we need human capital. Let's use these people, <laughs> let's develop our own people, but let's use what these other people have in a constructive way. So he understood very clearly this need to borrow from the experiences and capacity of other people. And I think if you look at mining industry, for example, I'm sure, you know, every poor country needs the, it needs the expertise, you know, the experience, the knowledge, the capital of Rio Tinto, zinc, or, you know, whoever it is, you know. Uh, so, so, yes, you have to borrow from that, but you have to discipline it and you have to use it for the good of the society. You know, in the same way, you know, in Botswana, you know, they made sure that De Beers came and mm -hmm. whatever, but they, De Beers came, you know, on the terms of the government. De Beers didn't come in and start looting stuff. You know, one of the very depressing, most depressing things I read recently is this one of these recent African progress reports where it looks at these mining contracts in the DRC and it shows how how, you know, how these international mining companies basically collude with people who are corrupt within right. the Congolese state to cheat the Congolese people of their wealth. So these mining companies can be very unscrupulous as well. So yes, you need their human capital and you need what they can bring to the table, but that has to be disciplined. You know, it has to be disciplined by a proper political system and a proper process and institutional and human capital and capacity of the country. So, so it's a... It's a complementary process, but everything has to get into place.